Hi everyone and welcome to Dennis Deep Cuts, the 17th installment. Today we're talking about one of my favorite subjects and that's books. And today we're going to dive into some books that are very specific of a very specific genre. Let's see what happens. <laughs> But first things first, uh, last Friday, a week ago, I released a new album with the band Fake Names. It's a record called Expendables that we recorded in uh, Aspie Park in Jersey about a year ago. And it's finally out on Epitaph Records. Um, I'm sure you can find it on in your local record store or if you want to stream it, go ahead and stream it. Um, if you don't know who the fake names is, I'll give you a quick rundown. It is, um, it's almost like a DC punk band, but I'm not from DC, I'm actually from Sweden. Uh, I sing, and then we have um, Brian Baker, he used to be in bands like Minor Threat, Dag Nasty, Junkyard, Bad Religion, Beat Rats, and many, many more. He plays the guitar, complete genius. Another genius is, of course, Michael Hampton. that also plays the guitar. Um, he played, of course, in Henry Rollins' first band, SOA. And then he played in a, a great band called Faith. And then he was in Embrace, which me and Brian uh, might hold as one of the best Discord records ever released. He was in One Last Wish, and then he was also in a band called The Snakes, and the very underrated Manifesto. Yeah, he plays the guitar. And then we have uh, Johnny Temple on bass. Johnny Temple, of course, from bands such as Soulside, Girls Against Boys, and New Wet Kojak. And the latest addition to this fine group of uh, people is uh, Brendan Canty on drums. Um, He's been in a bunch of bands such as Deadline, Mass Aesthetics, One Last Wish, Happy Go Licky, and of course a little band called Fugazi. Yeah, fake names, Expendables, out on Epitaph Records. Ever since I started listening to music, uh, all things surrounding the music has always been fascinating to me. The way people dress, the way the artwork looks, or the little details that distinguishes one scene from another. Um, all these things that elevates music into being more than just music. Subcultures and youth cultures and everything around that, I just love it. Um, I've been fascinated in doing tons of research about that for the last couple of years 30 years 40 years <laughs> maybe uh, today we're going to look at a couple of books that are very genre directed and um, if you want to know more about these scenes and worlds these are perfect uh, jumping off points um, when i talked about books last time i talked about sammy's excellent books the bag i'm in that sort of uh runs through a whole slew of uh, subcultures, youth cultures. But today we're going to talk about books that just focuses on one of these different subcultures as youth cultures. Um, I find this very, very exciting and this is a very big part of uh, how I enjoy music. Um, so if you're a nerd like me, you might find something here that you really like or find some music that you like or some literature that you want to read. Yes. In the early 70s, rock music felt bloated. The popular bands of the day were obsessed with rock operas and grand spectacles. And um, as with any movement, there had to be a counter movement. And it happened in the early 70s in the shape of glam rock. Inspired by the traditional music hall vaudeville tradition of the UK and um, 50s rock and roll from America with equal footing in the art school and the assembly line 
Glam Rock became the latest teen sensation. Um, and this really nice book guides us through that entire journey. From the early days of proto-glam acts such as uh, Bowie, T-Rex, and Roxy Music, um, into the more uh, scene-oriented stuff where glam rock actually became like a thing with bands like Sweet and Slade. Um, it talks about how glam rock for a little bit got rid of the, like, not, not got rid of, but discarded the LP as the, 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 the perfect medium and went back to, to seven inches and singles and how singles dominated uh, the market in the early to mid 70s. Um, it also talks about the influence of Hollywood and Oscar Wilde and how the counter culture politics of the 60s got replaced with the sexual politics of the 70s. Um, you know, because of the, the flamboyant dressing, uh, the, the cross dressing and the, the, the wild styles that these bands had. Um, even though most bands and people were by no means anything other than straight white dudes, it did still challenge the status quo and it did still challenge the way people, you know, acted and the way people dressed. It also takes a look at uh, the influence glam rock had on movies and literature and it dives in on the American counterparts and glam, glam adjacent figures such as Alice Cooper, Lou Reed, Joe Bryant, Andy Warhol and of course the New York Dolls. Um, it's a pretty excellent book with tons of fantastic photos and there's so many pop culture references that you need like a notepad pad on your side when you're reading it. Um, it doesn't deep dive that hard into the more obscure and unknown mass of uh, glam bands uh, that especially came out of the UK. But there's still plenty of information about Susie Quattro and the Cockney Rebels and uh, Alex Harvey and so on and so forth. So. Um, I strongly recommend this book as a, as a great starting point if you want to know about all things glam rock. As I've already told you, uh, when I was a young pup, I was really into metal and um, metal was my life. Uh, I wanted to play music, but the excellence of most metal players was just, it seemed unreachable to me. Um, but I love the energy and the power of it. Um, and it wasn't until I discovered punk and hardcore that I, that I finally felt that I could actually play music, you know. But to get there, I made my way through crossover. You know, the metal bands that were inspired by punk and hardcore were the hardcore bands that had a slightly metallic edge to them. It was the perfect segue for a guy like me. So a couple of years, back I discovered this book and it is called Crossover The Edge where metal, punk and hardcore collide. Um, it does talk a bit about crossover and the history of the cultural impact of it but what most it does is that it talks about crossover bands from the 80s. The structure of the book is set up so it's, it seems rather geography than history. Uh, the first chapter deals with the East Coast of America when New York hardcore went metal. Bands such as Agnostic Front, Ludicrist, um, Crow Mags and Leeway, but also some more metal tinged bands like Prong and Whiplash. And uh, then it continues like that. Um, we have chapters of the Midwest, the Middle America, and the South. You have chapters of the West Coast. You have a chapter on Canada, the UK, the rest of the world, and much more. Um, it's like a couple of hundred bands from all over the world of this 80s kind of crossover thing. Um, tells their story, usually like how they got together, what their influences was, and it, the discography of all the bands. And it's everything from heavy, heavy hitters and well-known bands such as DRI, Suicide Tendencies, Nuclear Assault, Onslaught, Gangrene, and even Discharge. And uh, there are also a bunch of unknown bands such as The Beast, 
uh, social decay, snake nation, virus, and the band Agony from Sweden. Uh, the book is great, and if you want to expand your record collection of thrashy hardcore or hardcore influenced metal of the 80s, you need this book. Let's continue to talk about uh, uh, metal stuff for a little bit. Um, Sweeney has been very, very well known for its proficiency of exporting music to the world. And um, we could sit here and talk about ABBA, or we could sit here and talk about rock set or bands like that, but the truth of the matter is that there are a few scenes that has been as important as metal has. Uh, so my friend Ika wrote this book about Swedish metal. It's called Blood, Fire, Death in 2011. This is the Swedish version of the book. There's a, a English speaking version as well. English speaking, English written version. It doesn't speak English. It's written in English. Uh, it tells the story of Swedish metal all the way from the early players such as um, Heavy Load and Cannabis up until the 80s death metal scene with Entombed and up until new black metal such as The Tame. Um, it talks about the inspiration and influence and what shaped that scene and what brought metal uh, where it is today in Sweden basically. It also dives deep into bands like Bathory and Dissection and it has a full chapter about the Swedish dude Pelle Dead that was the singer of the infamous black metal band Mayhem from Norway and we all know what happened to that dude or if you don't know is Google it it's an interesting chapter for sure um, it's great storytelling and pretty much all the main players of Swedish metal is interviewed for this book um, and it doesn't shy away from the more controversial topics surrounding metal such as the connection to the extreme right and also the self-destructive suicidal nature and nihilism that's quite uh, prevalent within that world. Um, it also deals with how metal bands try to stay true to their ideals in a world where more and more people like their bands. Um, it's a great book and if you want an introduction and a history of Swedish metal I really recommend Blood, Fire and Death. It's a really good book. And Swedish metal is pretty awesome. So please check it out. A couple of weeks ago, I did an episode where I dove right into the dark depths of goth rock and presented you with some of the more unknown gems of that world. And thank you all for watching that episode. It's, it seems quite popular. Uh, if you want to dig deeper into that world, I really, really, really recommend this book. Somewhere Leather, Somewhere Lace. This is a spectacular visual representation of the 80s goth rock scene. Uh, it does tell the story of goth rock and its origins and the juxtaposition against the new romantic movement. It also tries to check in a little bit with other scenes uh, apart from the UK and see what was going on there. But more than anything, it's a book, book about fashion um, and style. There are tons of spectacular photos of goths throughout the 80s. And uh, it's heavy focus on clothing and accessories and the hair. Uh, it's a spectacular mix of glamour, darkness, death and leather. Uh, I think few subculturals are as visually striking as the goth style and perusing through this book I am slightly in awe of the fact that people look like this and I will never ever have the balls to pull, pull it off. <laughs> I mean, I, I need a haircut, so who knows? Maybe next time. <laughs> no. Let's finish up with something a bit more uh, colorful and lighthearted. In the 60s, uh, the music scene of Europe, and especially France, was in full swing. 
and uh, the scene I'm going to talk to you about now is probably the most commercial of all of them we talked about today and the most popular and I am talking of course about the yeah yeah scene yeah girls of the 60s French pop um, the yeah yeah scene was very much a continental European phenomenon usually with young women singing the music was a mix of 60s beat mixed with bubblegum pop but also had sweeping orchestral arrangements it's pretty fucking spectacular um one might call it like the european version of the american girl group of the 60s uh, but the yay scene was mostly focused on solo artists it's also a strange mix between um, portraying these girls as very sexualized but also very very innocent um it's a fascinating scene and world not only for the music but also for the fact that it's a movement stuck in between the more traditional roles of the early 60s and the whole generational change that 1968 brought about and even though this scene was very much pop in the very traditional sense uh, it was still an important movement for women uh, to find their voice and their place within a very very male dominated world um, while they were of course your, your normal products so to speak a lot of these women had very distinct and powerful voices and they were true songwriters that inspired millions this book is a delightful book that tells the story of the swinging 60s in france and the main players of that world such as france gall Francois hardy and jane birkin it, is all, it also talks about the yay scene's connection to movies and fashion and it dives into some of the more fringe elements of that world as well there's a whole chapter dedicated to the more psychedelic artists and there's also a chapter about artists the recorded records in French to sort of capitalize on that scenes such as uh, Dusty Springfield and Sonny and Cher and Dana Gillespie all did French songs in the yay style um, and if you're a record collector it's just shock full of albums and singles and artists uh, so be prepared to spend some of the hard-earned cash after you read this book um, there are a couple of really cool compilations of yay music uh, both from France but there are also similar scenes in, in Italy and in Spain and even in Sweden if you want to know anything about this scene this is the book it's it's pretty I mean it's it is pretty amazing so if you're curious about the the French GIA scene of the 60s please check out that book and uh, that's it for today it was a little bit of a shorter episode I had a busy week and I'm working and uh, just put out a new record with fake names um, yeah did you have you read any of these books what sort of uh, genre books do you like I mean there's there's plenty of uh, books about punk rock and hardcore and, and metal and so on and so forth so let me know which ones are your favorites which ones should I talk about next time I'll leave your comments in the comments section and um, yeah like share subscribe give me a reason to continue <laughs> <laughs> give me a reason to continue to do this every week uh thanks for watching and i'll see you next time my friends until then stay wild bye bye